Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here at Walden Community Church in Montgomery, Texas. We are in a series called Living Your Best Life. And today, I want to talk to you about the Bible. Dallas Willard, in his book, Renovation of the Heart, said, in order for our lives to be changed, we must take small steps, which quietly and certainly lead to pervasive inner transformation. And that's precisely what we're talking about in this sermon series, living our best life and the small shifts that we can take to get us there, making all of those goals reachable and obtainable. Because our best life is not out of reach. It's very possible. Because in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So we know it's possible because Jesus wants to give it to us. He wants to give you your best life. And today we're going to discover that reading the scriptures is one of the main ways that we can make that happen. Look at uh, what scripture itself tells us about what will happen when we read it. 2 Timothy 3 says, All scripture is breathed by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Here, Timothy lists four things that the Bible does for us. It teaches us. It shows us our true self, and Timothy calls that rebuking. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it trains us to become better. Gutenberg, not, not Steve, before him, long before him, Johannes Gutenberg, printing press, he made it possible to manufacture large numbers of books in relatively very little time. The Gutenberg Bible was the earliest major book printed using mass-produced movable type in Europe. Why was the printing press invented? Well, because before it was invented, all books had to be written by hand. And Gutenberg wanted more people to have access to the Word of God. What about Zwingli? Holdrich Zwingli, 1531. He founded the Swiss Reformation Church, and he was an important figure in the broader Reformation. Like Martin Luther, he accepted the supreme authority of Scripture, but he applied it much more rigorously and comprehensively to his doctrines and practices. Zwingli believed in taking Scripture as the inspired Word of God and placing that authority higher than anything humans could make. He said it was higher than church councils, higher than our church fathers, higher than priests. Like Gutenberg, like Martin Luther, he believed in sola scriptura, which means the Bible alone. The Word of God alone is enough. The Word of God can accomplish exactly what it needs to do in your life because it teaches us. It shows us our true self. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it trains us to become better. You know, the early revolutionaries of Christian heritage are believed that getting the Bible into the hands of the people in their own language was very important. And if someone had the Bible in their own language and they could read the Bible for themselves, that was enough. That alone was enough for anyone to be changed by its message. There was a 900-day siege in Leningrad during the Second World War. It was perhaps one of the most gruesome sieges in modern history. Hitler's diabolic plan was to choke all the food supply to a city of two million residents, and he was going to let them all starve to death. Leningrad must die of starvation, Hitler said in a speech in Munich, November 8, 1941. The following winter, hundreds of thousands of people starved to death. And people tried in vain to stay alive. They even went so far as to try to eat sawdust. Others froze to death in the streets because it was a cold winter. As the invading German army poured into the city, they would loot, they would destroy anything of value. A group of Russian botanists holed up inside the vault of the Vavilov Institute of Plants because they had collected this precious supply of edible botany. 
This collection contains seeds from nearly 200,000 varieties of plants, of which about a quarter of it was edible. It was one of the world's largest repositories of genetic diversity of food crops. In the storage, they had plenty of rice, wheat, corn, beans, and potatoes, easily enough to sustain the botanists during the siege. But the scientists hadn't barricaded themselves in the vault with food grains to save their own lives, but rather to protect the seeds from the Nazis, as well as to protect it from the starving people. The collection filled 16 rooms, and nobody who was in any room was allowed to be there alone. Workers guarded the storage in shifts all around the clock. They were numb with cold and emaciated from hunger. And as the siege dragged out, one by one, these heroic scientists started dying of hunger. But not a single grain was ever eaten. In January of 1942, Alexander Stukin, a peanut specialist, died right at his writing table. Botanist Dmitry Ivanov also died of starvation while surrounded by several thousand packs of rice that he was guarding. And by the end of the siege in the spring of 1944, nine of them had starved to death watching over all that food. And many of the crops that we eat today came from that same crossbreeding variety that the scientists had died to save. Isn't that the same situation we have with the Bible? We have the Word of God everywhere. We have it on the radio, we have it on TV, we have it on CDs, we have it on DVD, it's heard on the internet, it's over your PC, it's beamed through satellites, it's quoted in books, it's read to you at conferences, and every Sunday we hear it preached from the pulpit by our pastors. There are more than 450 translations of the Bible in English, in English. But most Christians are dying from spiritual and scriptural hunger. We are both saturated and depleted at the same time. The Bible is on refrigerator magnets. It's in our cupboards, on our coffee mugs. It's printed on t-shirts. It's on bumper stickers. It's playing over the music in our craft stores, but it's not in our hearts. The word is not being breathed and lived like it is supposed to be. You see, unless we do something with what we've heard and what we've read, we're just like a person who's dying, surrounded by food. Timothy says reading it will make you complete and equipped for every good work. You know, as the man of the house, I am the builder and the instructions reader by default. And when a new piece of furniture is purchased, a shelf, what have you, some complex toy maybe, it gonna, it's going to fall to me to build it. But I suffer from a condition known as don't need the directions. I mean, I casually, I look at pictures and I try to get the overall big picture, but I convince myself that because I can grow a beard, that means that I naturally understand how things work. I don't. More often, I'm forced to go back to the instructions to understand why my project doesn't look like the one in the picture. To live our best lives, we need to make a small shift and to place more priority, not to surround ourselves with the Bible, but to consume it, to allow the Word of God to get inside of us, to allow it to change us. We need to make time to read the instruction manual, the how-to of building, not, not, not a toy or a gift of, or furniture, but building a healthy spiritual life. The Hebrew hymnal says in Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. In Psalm 119, 103, it says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. In fact, the Bible is not only our instruction manual for growth, it's not only our light for direction, it is also a healing surgeon's scalpel. We need the Bible when we are spiritually ill. Hebrews 4 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. 
Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Ephesians chapter 6 calls the word of God your sword. It's a weapon that you use to fight evil. Jesus used the word of God to battle temptation when he was in the desert with the devil. And Jesus said confidently in that moment, man cannot live by bread alone, but rather by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's how important it is. To live our best life, we need to ingest the word of God. Timothy makes some really good points. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God, right? And that's your number one. All scripture is breathed out by God. Look, if you don't believe this book is inspired by God, then really what good is it, right? What good is it? And then the Bible just becomes another self-help book. It's just another book on morality. It's just another good read. Timothy said that it's breathed out by God. So it's not enough to just say, well, I believe some parts of the Bible are true. Or I only believe that there are some parts of the Bible that are relevant for today. Or, you know, I only think some parts of the Bible should be followed. Which parts? The parts that you agree with? The parts that make you feel good? The parts that don't make you feel guilty? You don't get to pick your top three favorite Ten Commandments. You have to do everything that's in here. You can't just skip the parts you don't like. You can't just say, well, you know what? Uh, I, yeah, I'm not going to murder and I'm not going to steal, but the whole uh, lying and adultery thing, I don't know. I think that's a gray area. This book is either the Word of God or it's not. And if it's not, then don't waste your time with it. Now, one could make the argument, well, how is it God's word if it was written by people? Okay, let's say you are a musician, okay? You're a musician and you're in an orchestra and you've picked the trumpet to be your instrument. The music that we all hear when you play the trumpet is being produced by your breath, right? It's coming out of your breath. It's your mouth. The trumpet is just a tool. Your breath is turning the trumpet into recognizable sounds. But what if you picked up the tuba and you played it? It would still be your breath that was coming out of that tuba. It would sound different because it's a different instrument, but it would still be your breath. Same breath, different instrument. It's the same exact way with the Bible. The breath of God is played through human writers. Same breath, but we just hear it different ways. So Moses writes differently than David, who writes differently than Amos, who writes differently than Jonah, who writes differently than Matthew. The inspiration is the same, same breath, just a different source. It's all God's breath. Second, Timothy says the Bible is profitable for teaching. You know, there has to come a time when we ask, what is truth? What is true in the world? I hope that it's not being defined as whatever the government says or politicians say or the news says or Facebook says. I hope not. Jesus promises in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But how can the truth set you free if the truth is always changing? And what is true today is not true tomorrow. We're told in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Christ is truth and Christ is, Christ is always the same, then the truth is always the same because it's, it's God's truth right? It's God's truth. And remember, this is his world, and it's his world, so truth is a constant. So perhaps you could read it as the truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Bible is the place where you will find that truth. Third, Timothy says the Bible also corrects you when you're wrong. You know, it's not enough just to get our teaching from the Bible, but we also need to go to it for our conduct. 
The Bible is the source of our belief, yes, but it's also the source of our behavior. The Word of God should make a difference in how we live our best life. And if it's not, then we're doing something wrong. Jesus told Nicodemus that Christians were born again, which means they had a new beginning. They were new creations. And that should signify then new behavior. And that should come across in how we act and how we live. Lastly, Timothy says the Bible trains us to become better. You know, there was another great theologian of our church history, and that was Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor for 38 years at the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, England. And during that time, his church grew to 5,000 people in attendance. And he became known around the world for his preaching, and this was long before television. One time, very famously, he said to his congregation, there is enough dust on some of your Bibles that you could write the word damnation with your finger. For some, the Bible just sits there, and we believe it's full of do thises and do thats, but a lot of don't do that. And we don't like being told what to do. But there are actually more do's in the Bible than don'ts. And really, if you spent all your time following and obeying the do's, you wouldn't even have time to get to the don'ts. For others, the Bible sits there because they've just gotten out of practice. It was something they used to do, but along the way, life just kind of choked it out. Or maybe when they go to the Bible, they just find the words hard to understand. Here's the secret. Are you ready? If you really want to know what's in the Bible, then you have to read it. It can't just sit there. You have to become more familiar with it. If it's hard to understand, press on. Ask questions. If it's boring, press on. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And it's available to you every single day. You are surrounded by it in your life. God wants to give you the very best life. But in order for that to happen, that book has got to open. He has given you the book to help you. He's given you his own words to help you, and he's given you his Holy Spirit to help you understand that book. But it's got to open. You've got to ingest it. You've got to read it and make it a part of your life. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, you have caused all the Holy Scriptures to be written. You've done that for our learning, for our correction, for our training in righteousness. Help us to hear these words, to read them, to underline them, to learn them, to inwardly digest them, so that we can be encouraged, so that we can be supported. Lord, we want to embrace all the ways that you love us. We want to have that same joyful hope. We want to look forward to the everlasting life which you offer us through your Son. May we be students of your word. May we hunger for it. May we thirst for it. And may we consume it. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I want to invite you to come to church. I want to welcome you back. I want you here. I want you to fill these pews. We have two services. We have a traditional service at 930 with our choir, and we have a contemporary worship service at 11 o'clock with our worship team. That is also the time where we have something for children, and we have youth group. We also have a youth group that meets Wednesdays each night, uh, Wednesdays during the week, and they meet over in the Fellowship Center, and you can learn more about all of our programs at waldenchurch.com. Thanks, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.